Coming up on today's Kentucky Outlook, our guest is theoretical physicist and best-selling author, a man who believes that we are on the cusp of some amazing innovations as we embark on the golden age of brain research. Dr. Michio Kaku predicts a future of synthetic robodocs, DNA chips in our toilets to predict cancer, synthetic organs, driverless cars, and unprecedented brain power through brain chips, telepathy, and decoding our dreams. Coming up on today's Kentucky Outlook, a conversation with Dr. Michio Kaku. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're very honored to have with us today, and I want you to listen up. This is going to be an interesting conversation with Dr. Michio Kaku, who is a theoretical physicist, and he has now authored the number one bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. It's called The Future of the Mind. He is a professor of physics at the City College and the City University of New York, and as I mentioned, the author of this new book, author of many books. So we are very honored to have you with us, Dr. Glad Kaku. Glad to be on the show. Glad, glad to have you here. You know, before we get started, we have to define what the term theoretical physicist means. Well, think Einstein. Okay. Think Newton. People who don't do experiments to get their hands dirty, but they theorize, they dream about the principles which drive the entire universe. A handful of equations by Newton and Einstein changed everything around us. I'm a theoretical physicist in that tradition. What we want is an equation one inch long that will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. We want to summarize all the laws of the universe into a single equation which will summarize everything we know about the universe. From the Big Bang, to the creation of stars and galaxies, to the creation of people, and maybe even love. All of that in one equation. That's a lofty goal, Dr. Kaku. That was the goal set forth by Albert Einstein, and that's what we are doing today. That's why we have this gigantic atom smasher outside Geneva, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider, to test aspects of Einstein and the quantum physicists who created this huge theory, which we call the theory of everything. T-O-E. The theory of everything. We might also mention that Dr. Kaku is the co-founder of something called the string field theory. And I want to talk a little bit about that. You've got some fascinating stuff in the book about dreams, telepathy, and the future. And uh, so I don't even know where to begin, but let's begin with the string field theory. The string field theory allows you to summarize what we call string theory into an equation one inch long. String theory says that everything you see around us, all these point particles called electrons and protons and neutrons, are nothing but vibrating rubber bands. And each note corresponds to a particle. Why do we have electrons and protons? They're nothing but different frequencies on a tiny rubber band. So physics is nothing but the harmonies you can create on all these little vibrating strings. Chemistry is the melodies you can play on these vibrating strings. The universe is a symphony of these strings. And the mind of God is cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. We now have a unifying principle by which we can summarize all physical laws into a simple equation. And this is something that you helped to co-found. That's right. That's my equation. That's your equation. And so this equation has to be proven? Yes, that's why the Large Hadron Collider is one step in that direction. That's a $10 billion machine. That's a pretty penny. It's bigger than the city of Geneva. It's a huge machine, and it tests only the periphery of string theory. Ultimately, string theory is a theory of the Big Bang itself. And it will answer some of the deepest questions that philosophers have grappled with. Is time travel possible? Are there other universes? Are there gateways to parallel universes? These are things that philosophers have talked about, but nothing ever came of it. Now we have a theory which, in principle, in the future, could answer these questions. You said will. When you were talking about it, you said will answer some of these questions. So you feel optimistic that this indeed will be the case. That's right. I think so. I think this is the completion of Einstein's dream of a theory of everything that he spent 30 years of his life chasing after, but ultimately failed. And yet, why did he fail? 
he didn't go far enough because back at the 1930s and 40s, they didn't have the nuclear force. They didn't know about atomic bombs and stars and fusion. They didn't know anything about what's inside the atom. Now we do. And when we go inside the atom, what, we, what do we find? We think we find vibrating strings. And the melodies of these strings we call particle physics. And that's why we are spending literally billions of dollars to create conditions found at the instant of Genesis itself. The Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva is a Genesis machine. It recreates some of the conditions found in the Bible. I, I'm seeing uh, you, uh, through my telepathy, no, I, uh, some in the audience are going, what? They're, they're wanting to, you know, get into the mind of God. You know, it's not religious, but people tend to, to find that there's a little gray area in between those two places. So getting support for some of the work that you're doing sometimes hits a, hits a roadblock, doesn't it? Well, you know, the um, Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva, Switzerland, was originally supposed to be in Texas. Okay. It was supposed to be right outside Dallas, called the Super Collider. Well, in the last day of hearings, one congressman asked a physicist, $10 billion? What are we going to find? Are we going to find God with your machine? If so, I will vote for it. Well, the poor physicist didn't know what to say. So he said, we will find the Higgs boson with this machine. Well, all the jaws hit the floor in Congress. Can you imagine $10 billion to find another god darn subatomic particle? <laughs> the vote was taken the next day, and they canceled our machine and set back American physics 30 years. Now it's in Switzerland, not in Dallas, Texas. It's in Switzerland because we couldn't answer that question. Will we find God with your machine? Since then, we physicists have run that question over and over in our minds. How should we have answered that question? I would have answered it differently. I would have said, God, by whatever signs or symbols you ascribe to the deity, this machine, the super collider, will take us as close as humanly possible to his greatest creation, Genesis. This is a Genesis machine. It will help to unravel some of the deepest secrets of the creation of the universe itself. You have very strong opinions about the status of science in America, mm -hmm. in our country, uh, in that we, and I think you call it H-1B, is uh, one of the, the greatest assets we have in keeping America in the con as a contender when it comes to the science world. Help us understand that. Yeah, you know, people ask the question, every poll shows that American students score dead last compared to Europeans, compared to Asians in science and math. Dead last, we have one of the worst educational systems known to science, and yet we still produce Nobel Prize winners. Look at Silicon Valley, churning out innovation all the time. What's the secret? People come to this country and they say, well, your scores are awful. This country should collapse scientifically. And yet, here we are with Silicon Valley and all these new products, right? Well, we have a secret weapon. And that is H-1B. That is the genius visa. If you are a, quote, genius in physics or math, whoom, you go right through immigration. Come on down right to the U.S. Mm -hmm. But remember, this is not stable. We can't maintain a brain drain forever because ultimately some of these scientists go back to China or India or, or where they came from. So that's why science education in America we have a long ways to go to rejuvenate it, to make it exciting. And one of the reasons why I write books and, and do interviews on TV and radio is to excite young people about the enormous possibilities in science. You know, when I was a kid, we had the quote Sputnik moment, oh, when yeah. Sputnik went up and it was your patriotic duty to go up against the Russians. It was your duty to become a physicist or a mathematician. Well, hey, Sputnik's been canceled. There is no manned space program anymore. So how can we get young people interested in science without a new Sputnik moment? I think that's where things like PBS, and that's where things like uh, cable television and books and documentaries, we have to fill the gap to inspire young people. Why? Because science is the engine of prosperity. Where does wealth ultimately come from? It doesn't come from politicians arguing about how to cut the pie thinner and thinner and thinner. We need a bigger pie. And where does that bigger pie come from? It comes from science. Let me give you an example. 
Some people say, you're a quantum physicist. What has quantum physics done for me lately? Huh? Huh? <laughs> In my pocketbook? Well, let me tell you. We quantum physicists created the transistor. We created the laser. And a huge chunk of the wealth of the planet Earth revolves around two creations done by quantum physicists. Transistors made possible computers, the internet, GPS, all the goodies we see in our living room. And lasers make possible the internet, telecommunications. So think about it. That's what quantum physics has done for you lately. And the answer is, what has it done for me? Everything. Nice segue to talk about the brain. The name of your book is The Future of the Mind. We now, you talk about this brain drain that we have, but President Obama has declared a brain initiative. So is that then the new frontier? The old frontier, we think, was the Human Genome Project. Three billion dollars to create a disk. A disk with all your genes on it that you'll eventually put on your credit card that gives you a complete profile of the genes necessary to create you. That has revolutionized medicine. Now, the next big project is the Brain Initiative to create a disk with all the pathways of the human brain on it. The short-term benefits is it'll allow us to understand mental illness. And mental illness is one of the oldest afflictions of humanity. And perhaps it's because of a miswiring in this map of the human brain. But not only that, we'll be able to record memories, upload memories, connect the brain to a computer so that we can manipulate computers and things around us, create a brain net, an internet of emotions, an internet of sensations, not just digital signals. In other words, we're witnessing the next big explosion in science is deciphering the brain. That's right. But now you mentioned that you have two daughters and, and one is a neurologist and it just appears to me we know so little about the brain. You know how far we've come and yet how far we need to go. In the last 10 to 15 years we've learned more about the brain than in all of human history combined because of two factors. First, advanced physics. We can now probe the brain and see thoughts ricocheting like a ping pong ball right across the brain. We could never do that before. We could even take this mass of data from the brain. And the second great innovation is computers. Computers to analyze this and to create a picture. A picture of what you are thinking about. Okay, wait, stop, we gotta talk about this. So you're telling me that technology, and, and of course technology is the great asset in a lot of this too. We now have the means to do these kinds of things. So we are at the place where with some type of chip inserted in or near the brain, you are able to decode these thoughts. Uh, yes, that's right. We can put a chip, in fact the Pentagon is putting millions of dollars in this project putting a chip into the brain of wounded warriors from Iraq and Afghanistan, connecting that wire to a laptop and then to a mechanical arm and a mechanical leg so that these wounded warriors will walk again. The gift of mobility, their life will come back. And Stephen Hawking, my colleague in physics, the great cosmologist, he's lost control of his fingers now. He's totally paralyzed. So. We physicists put a chip in his right glass. Next time you see him on TV, look at his right frame. His glasses, There's a chip okay. there with, ha with an antenna that picks up his brain waves, deciphers them, and allows him to control a laptop computer. So these people now who are paralyzed can now surf the web, read email, write email, operate their wheelchair, operate household appliances. Anything you can do on a computer, they can also do, and they are totally paralyzed. So, so that brings to mind then consciousness being these little data points. Is that? Well, consciousness is still a very big thing in, in neurolog neurological research. What we're doing is trying to marry consciousness to a computer so that we can record memories, play them back, and use it to operate machines. So for example, we now can take an animal and record a memory of it doing something play the memory back after it forgot that task and instantly it'll remember. We've done it with mice now. Next will be primates. We're gonna record primates eating bananas and doing what they do in a cage. Reinsert that memory back and they will learn it on the first try. The short-term goal is a brain pacemaker. A brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients. 
Think of all the millions of people who don't know who they are, who their loved ones are, where they left their keys, and where they live. We will have a brain pacemaker, so you push a button, and all of a sudden, you remember everything. You remember who you are, where you left the keys, you remember who your kids are. And beyond that, this is now science fiction, but beyond that, maybe you'll upload the memory of a vacation that you never had. Maybe you flunked a course in college, and boy, you, would learn, you want to learn calculus. Why not push a button and learn these things? Oh, I've always thought that would be fascinating. But isn't there, like everything else, uh, too overload possible? Maybe you can have a, too much memory? Well, there is a downside to this. Uh, what happens if a criminal gets access to this and uploads a memory of a crime that you never committed? All of a sudden, you have memories of, of being a criminal when you never actually committed a crime at all. And our criminal justice system depends on eyewitness accounts so that you tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But if you can upload memories that are false, then there's a problem of, of which memories you trust and which eyewitness accounts do you trust. So in the future, this will have to be regulated. In other words, certain memories will have to be imprinted as being false. So you know that the vacation you're now experiencing is really a false vacation, but you're doing it for fun. Talk, let's talk about uh, genetics uh, to the extent that uh, maybe you're, you have a memory at one moment and you've never been to this place and yet it seems very familiar to you, but it may have been a place that your grandfather or great-grandfather had been. So is there some link to that, that genetic Well, link? we're beginning to tease apart all the folklore of the brain. For example, out-of-body experience, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel when, when you have a near-death experience, mm -hmm. deja vu. We can brain scan people now and actually see this in progress. For example, we now know that out-of-body experiences can actually be induced with, for example, like the flick of a light switch. We can actually induce out-of-body experience. The brain here, we've mapped the surface of the brain. One part of the brain deals with eyesight, another part deals with balance. If you excite the area between the two, the brain gets confused. Is it eyesight I'm looking at? Is it balance I'm looking at? And that's where out-of-body experience comes from. And just like putting on a light switch, you can induce that effect at will and then turn it off by exciting that layer between the two halves of the brain. And also near-death experiences. The Air Force has wanted to know why is it that pilots black out when they're in a dive? They put these pilots in a, an ultra-centrifuge and spun them so fast they gradually became unconscious. And then blood drained from the outside of their vision and they lost eyesight toward the outside inward. That uh -huh. is the light at the end of the tunnel. Because in a near-death experience, you have oxygen deprivation. The outside, the peripheral vision loses blood. And that's why you see the light focusing at the end of the tunnel. But there are mysteries. For example, some people that have been hit on the left temporal lobe here suddenly become mathematical geniuses. This is something right out of the comic books. Don't do this at home, though. Don't go banging your head on the <laughs> left-hand <laughs> side, right? But don't take a hammer tonight. No, no, and no. And don't bang yourself, because this is a very rare circumstance, but it's actually happened in the past. And we're now beginning to understand all the quirks of the brain that, that we've learned about since we were children, folklore, old wives' tales. Now we can actually see the brain scans of these things. For example, mental illness and schizophrenia. Why is it that certain people hear voices? It turns out that, again, the left part of your brain naturally generates voices when you talk to yourself. When you talk to yourself, this part of the brain lights up. But in schizophrenics, this part of the brain lights up without their permission. The front part of the brain, which is your conscious brain, does not talk that well with the side of the brain. And as a consequence, you hear voices that you are generating yourself without your permission. But it's a disconnect it's at a some disconnect. point. And so is there a point at which there can be a reconnection? That we don't know. We're just beginning to realize that a lot of mental illnesses are because of the miswiring of the brain. That's why brain 2.0 is so important. We want to create a map a map so we can see the wiring of the brain and see why certain forms of mental illness occur because the brain is miswired. Which leads us to dreams. You, you write and talk a lot about dreams in your book, The Future of the Mind. Let's talk about the importance of dreams. You, you believe they're very important to our well-being, to our 
everything. When you brain scan someone who is dreaming, you find, first of all, that the front part of their brain is deprived of blood. That's why dreams go fantastic in fantastic directions. That's why Log I can fly in my dreams? <laughs> That's right. Logic and things that make sense all of a sudden don't make sense anymore because this part of the brain is basically shut off. The part that lights up is the center of the brain, like the amygdala, which also <laughs> controls fear. And that's why nightmares are more common than pleasant dreams, because that part of the brain that's excited is the brain of anxiety, the brain of fear. Now we think that perhaps there's a reason for that. Perhaps there are unresolved problems. Perhaps the brain has to work through certain things that it fears. Pleasant dreams, yeah, we've been there, we've done that, we know how to deal sure. with it. But tension, things that have involve uh, worries and problems are not resolved. And maybe that's one reason why we have dream. Now that, of course, is a theory. Now, lucid dreaming was once considered a theory, where you are conscious while you are dreaming. You can direct the course of your dream. Last year, we proved it to be true. Uh -huh. We put a person who is a lucid dreamer in a brain scan, ask him to change the direction of his dream, and he did it at will. <laughs> Wow. It's really true. There are people who can control the direction of their dream. And now at Berkeley, what they've done is they've taken people who are dreaming, put them in an MRI machine, looked at all the 30,000 dots that you get when you look at the electrical activity of the brain, run it through a computer, and it creates a picture. Now these pictures are not very good. Of course, this is just the beginning of this technology. But the very fact that we can even talk like this is amazing. One day, perhaps, you'll press a button and see the dream that you had the previous night. And be able to decipher and make sense of it or see how it... And you can train yourself to be a lucid dreamer. There are Buddhist texts, centuries old, that actually tell you the training process of how to consciously control the direction of your dream. This is something right out of the movie Inception. It, it really is, and, and it's, it's something right out of any science fiction movie. But I have to ask you this, you, the human being, do you fear these changes, or do you look upon them with joy and, and uh, well, amazement? Think of 100 years, 150 years ago. People said the body was sacred. We should not open up the body. It was meant to be if you have cancer and things are growing inside mm -hmm. your body. Now we realize, no. When you open up the body, you can cure disease and suffering. Think of all the people that have undergone surgery that have added years to their life and have gotten their life back as a consequence. And so the same thing with the brain. The brain is imperfect. It has mental illness. It's susceptible to drugs. It has problems with depression. Why not cure some of these problems? For example, we now can put probes in the brain to see that certain parts of the brain are hyperactive. And if you can actually eliminate that excess electrical activity, you can eliminate Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Why do people have tremors like Michael J. Fox? Because you can see in a brain scan, certain clusters of neurons are overactive. We can now put probes in the brain and deaden that area and boom, the tremors disappear instantly. And people who are chronically depressed, a certain fraction of them have resisted psychotherapy, resisted drug therapy, everything they resisted. And again, you can see certain areas of the brain being hyperactive. By deadening that area instantly, lifelong depression has suddenly disappeared. We photographed this for a BBC special that I once hosted. A woman said she's always had these anxiety attacks and depression all her life. Instantly, they disappeared. Just like that. So I don't see any fear there. I just see a passion and excitement. However, there are, of course, pitfalls that we have to negotiate, okay? We have to make sure that people democratically decide that, yes, this is the way we want this to go. But also, look, let's face it, there are ethical problems, too. Absolutely. A certain fraction of psychopaths, serial killers, if you brain scan them, you can actually see that some of them, their pleasure center lights up when they see other people being tortured. In other words, they take pleasure out of seeing other people being tortured, but they're not torturing anybody. But, but the question is why? What is it about their pathway Well, that's... first you put them in jail, okay? If they haven't committed a crime, I don't see how you can put them in jail, but I think that once they do commit a crime, that's a good enough reason for putting them away and, and throwing away the key, okay? Why, we don't know, whether it's nurture or nature. If you look at their history, for example, a lot of them tortured animals uh, when they were children. Yeah. So the whole idea of torturing other living beings 
starts with animals and then it works up their way up to humans. But hey, look, there are a lot of exceptions to the rule too. And a lot of us have weird thoughts and we don't necessarily go to jail as a them. consequence. Yes. But you can see immediately this had ethical considerations. In fact, already some serial killers are saying, I shouldn't be put in jail because my brain made me do it, right? Uh -huh. Well, yeah, maybe your brain did make you do it, but you should go to jail anyway. We're just about out of time. What do you do to make sure and ensure that your brain is as the best it can be? What do you do? Well, the brain is sort of like a muscle. You have to exercise it, keep it going, stimulate it with new and interesting things. And believe it or not, it is the most complex object in the known universe. We haven't seen anything in science as complex as the brain. And yet, there it is sitting on your shoulders. Just like that. Using only 20 watts of power, 20 watts of power. So when someone calls you a dim bulb, that's a compliment. <laughs> so remember that if someone calls you a dim bulb. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And a very special thank you to WKU's Cultural Enhancement Series, Kelly Scott, and for getting you here. Continued success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've been talking with Dr. Michio Kaku, the author of his most recent book right now on the New York Times bestselling, bestsellers list, The Future of the Mind. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. Thank you. That was nice.